All right, here it is. Another episode of Let There Be Talk, number 675. Yes, episode 675 today. On this, what is that? What is What do they call this Monday? Like, it was Black Friday, and then it's like... Is it uh, Cyber Monday? I don't know. People out there going crazy. I got to spend money on shit I don't need. Cyber Monday, November 28th. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Hope you didn't blacken someone's eye over politics at the turkey table. I had a great Thanksgiving. Enjoyed a little uh, chill. Did a lot of shows this week. I did three on Wednesday, the night before Thanksgiving. Then I did three on the Friday, the Black Friday, which was great. Then celebrated my 10-year anniversary as a paid regular at the Comedy Store on Saturday night in the main room. 10 years. I, you know, I cannot believe it's been 10 years it seems like a long time ago, and then it seems like a, uh, a short time ago, if that makes any sense. Like, in comedy, in your career, as long as you go, there's these pockets, and they, like when your first couple years, you're, you're open micing. Maybe some people open mic for four or five years. I, I open mics for, even when I was a paid regular, after three years of doing comedy, I kept doing open mics, and... I'll pop on one here and there now. But um, you have these, uh, you know, these eras of comedy. You're open mic it seemed like you were going to be there forever. I'm never getting out of this open mic how do you, How do you get further? How do you, how do you get gigs? It's, you know, you're going through that for years, and then you, you start to get a couple gigs here and there, and you're like, okay. All right, I, I, I got a good seven minutes. I can go out there and, and open for someone. And then you get like 10 minutes, and, and then you got 15. You think you got 15 until you find out real quick you probably have about three minutes when you have a bad set and no one's laughing and you're burning through your material. You're like, I thought I had 15. Nah, you got about three minutes, kid. That's all you got in you. Anyway, 10 years, paid regular. It was definitely um, the greatest thing that ever happened to me, uh, you know, in a music career or comedy career or my life. The greatest thing was becoming a paid regular at the comedy store. The most uh, legendary and historic comedy venue in the world. In the world. At the time, I think there was only like 418 people that were ever made a paid regular. Paid regular means the club. Uh, for years, it was Mitzi. And then it was uh, Tommy. And then it was Adam. And now it's Emily. And these people would say, you can work here. You can call in on Mondays. And you can tell us your avails. What are your avails for this week? You call in on Monday and on Tuesday, you find out what days you're going to work that week at the comedy store. There is no greater feeling than that first day of calling in. Uh, comedy store this is Quincy. Whoever answers is always Quincy when I call. Uh, what do you got? You're like, oh, I can work uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday and Saturday and Sunday. Okay, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday. No Friday? No, no, no Friday. Okay, yeah. And then you fucking get a couple dates or whatever. I wish I, wish I would call in. I want to get to that level. That's the only level. I'm, that's the next level I want to get to, and I'm good. I don't need to be famous. I just want to be fucking funny, and I want to get to that level where they go, all right, we got you every night this week. Oh, killer. <laughs> that is the level I'm looking to get. But thanks to the Shore family for uh, keeping the incredible venue alive and open and just rocking Comedy Store. 
better than ever, man. Every night just packed, just rocking. So I went on Saturday night, did the main room. Main room's the big room. If you've never been there, there's three rooms. You got the original room, which is my favorite. The belly room, which is the smaller, cool room to work on shit. I work on shit on all the rooms, but, you know. And then the main room is the big, big date night. We're out seeing comedy. Big, cool theater vibe. I like all three. They're all different animals, and I love them. But if I had to choose one, it would be the original room. I've probably had some of the greatest sets of my life in that original room. So, 10 years. And then December 6th coming up here will be, uh, is it December 6th or the 9th? Hold on. I think it's December 6th. December 6th will be my 13-year anniversary of doing stand-up comedy, man. Over 5,000 shows. I'm not here tooting my horn. I'm just, I like to keep track of that shit in case anybody thinks that like, oh man, you just went up a couple times and then you were just fucking, you made it. Yeah, I have not made it. I'm still trying to get funny and I still love it more than anything, more than life. Comedy is the reason I get up each day and it is the reason I live in Los Angeles. I just love being in the Los Angeles comedy scene. It's fucking great. Anyway, thank you to everybody for your kind words on my Instagram for the uh, 10-year anniversary. Speaking of anniversaries, I'm going to make this announcement right now. And uh, listen carefully because it is, uh, it's, a, it's a big announcement in my world. 43 years ago-ish, coming up, I did a tribute to Bon Scott, the greatest singer ever, in my eyes, of rock and roll. The blueprint for frontman, the blueprint for outlaw rock and roll singer, Bon Scott, just legendary. And uh, he passed away. Years and years ago, I decided, okay, I want to do a tribute to him. And I gathered around some of my favorite bands at that time. I believe it was Death Angel did it. Some Exodus guys uh, did it. Uh, some Jet Boy guys did it. Some guys from uh, Vane. I, uh, uh, what's it? Paul Gilbert came down and played. Mike Varney. It was... It was all these guys, and we put it together and did it for years at the Stone in San Francisco. And then when that closed, uh, we moved it over to the bottom of the hill. And the core was always usually Josh Z and myself, both incredible lovers of ACDC. Josh Z being one of the greatest Angus Young uh, guitar-style players ever. This guy can play Angus Young, he can channel him to the top T, man. And that was always our bond, big time. Josh and I just fucking love ACDC, but not in a buffoon way, you know, like, fucking just, to, just enjoy the insanity of the songwriting and the power of the live shows. Do yourself a favor and put on that film let There Be Rock. It's on YouTube. Put that on and sit back and enjoy the fierce power coming off that screen. And, you know, years later, I uh, decided to uh, fire it back up. And, uh, and what better way than to do it with some of my comedian friends that absolutely loved ACDC especially Bill Burr, and him being uh, a drummer, I thought, man, let's, let's fire this up. So I turned 50, that was uh, almost seven years ago, and we did Del Rey at the El Rey, and we've been doing it for a bunch of years now, and then COVID hit, and I said it was the last one. The last one I said was going to be the last one, but I'm pulling the old uh, The Who or, or Kiss or any of those other guys with the farewell tours, but to tell you the truth, I wanted to bring it back because I felt we did it the day before the world shut down from COVID. 
uh, a few years ago. The next day, everything changed. The world changed. And a lot of people didn't come to the show because there was some fear of COVID. So I thought, you know what? Let's do this again. And uh, so we are doing it again, January 10th. And uh, it'll be at the Avalon in Los Angeles. It's a Tuesday night. And I will tell you this, it will sell out. So get your tickets right away. I should have the ticket link up later today, uh, Monday here. Uh, Patreon uh, supporters will get the first shot at the tickets. There's going to be some VIP tickets and all of that. So Patreoners will have the first shot. And let me give you a little taste of some of the players that are going to be involved. Bill Burr will be doing comedy. I will be doing comedy. And that will be the first part of the show, a comedy show. Then we will uh, take a little break and then bring out a full-blown all-star band with... Uh, I'll get, check this out. I got Lur from Primus, Dave Lombardo from Slayer, Billy Rowe from Buck Cherry Jet Boy, Brad Wilk from Rage Against the Machine, Josh Z, Mike Inez, Allison Chains on the bass, Scott Ian, absolute another ACDC fanatic like myself and the way that we bonded over the years was talking ACDC and our love. Scott Holliday, from the great rival son, Steve Gorman, will be uh, the drummer for most of the night. And this man can do the Phil Red thing. Great. Black Crow's only drummer in my eyes, Steve Gorman. And uh, some more to be announced. The Church of Bon Scott, a tribute to ACDC. January 10th, 2023. It is back. And uh, tell a friend... Get your tickets when I put the link up right away. Patreoners, like I said, will be first. All right. This episode will conclude my Marcus King tour diary. And uh, my guest today is Mike Runyon, sleeveless Mike, uh, he is known as. And uh, he is a B3 player, clavinet, piano, keyboard player for Marcus King. A fantastic human. And as I listened back to the episode last night, it just made me smile. I love this man. His spirit is amazing. The entire Marcus King band, each guy in this band uh, is just a joy to hang out with. And all of these guys are just fucking solid humans. So it was great to talk to Mike. He joined uh, Marcus, I believe, about a year ago. He is on the B3, like I said, bringing out the beautiful sounds of uh, that keyboard. Everybody knows I love B3. I fell in love with it years ago. Some of the greatest B3 players out there. Uh, you know, Rami Jaffe, great from Wallflowers and Foo Fighters. Love his playing. Ben Montench, who I've had on the show also. Uh, great B3 player. The... Uh, the great uh, Ben Jacobs, who played in my band. Not many people know him, but the people that do know how good he is. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, great to talk to B3 players. Just love it. Gertie is snoring next to me. Full blast. Uh, do yourself a favor. Follow Sleeveless Mike on, uh, that's his nickname, <laughs> Sleeveless Mike. Sometimes known as Headband Mike, but uh, follow him on Instagram and give him some big love. The guy is just solid. Once again, this is the last of the Marcus King Tour Diary. I will never forget this tour. I will never forget these humans. They will be in my life for the rest of my life. And I love reaching out to them weekly and just, you know, reliving some of that great two months on the road. Thank you, everybody for uh, tuning in today. Keep rocking. Come see me in Philadelphia this weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday at Soul Joel's. Tickets at deandelray.com. Also, San Diego, I will be at the Grand Comedy Club. Uh, I think it's 15 and 16 of December and some more Bill Burr dates, December 8, 9, and 10 in uh, Salt Lake, Boise, and... Colorado. 
that winds down my uh, year of uh, shows. So please come out and support and have fun. And one last thing, I do have uh, a new batch of Gertie hoodies and sweatshirts. So go to the website, deandelray.com, or DM me, and I'll send them out. Uh, love all you guys. Keep the candles lit. And uh, here we go. Sleeveless Mike is in the house. All right, now we have keyboards. Introduce yourself, my man. Hey, my name is uh, Sleeveless Mike Runyon. I play keys for the Marcus King Band. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't worn sleeves since I was born. <laughs> sleeveless Mike. Also sometimes known as uh, Sleeveless or Headband Mike. Headband Mike is yeah. what you've been calling me, and I rather enjoy that. So, you know, the headband thing, you know, it depends on my hair. You know, sometimes I basically get off the bus every morning, and it's just a rat's nest. Yeah. And so, you know, you got to put it up. I just play golf with this headband on, and I've got double bogeys about every hole. So, <laughs> anyway. You and Jack out playing golf on the days off all the time. Yeah, man. It's been really, uh, it's been great, man. Pretty much every day uh, we've been off, we've we've played some courses. So, uh, it's been a good, good, uh, I mean, I'm not that good, but I can smash it sometimes, so. <laughs> yeah, and it gets you out of the bus and out of the hotel room and into some sunshine. Yeah, get some fresh air, and yeah, it's been cool, man. But uh, yeah, just crushed a few beers, so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. And now, you are the newest member, I would say, of the band, right? Yeah, so Drew, technically, Drew came in. Well, yeah, Drew, yeah. Drew, but he had played with Marcus in the past, so he had... Uh, you know, played a few gigs, I guess, sat in and, and stuff. Uh, was it with uh, Bishop Gunn, I guess, when they were on the road? But yeah, I came in last fall. Um, it's about September, late September. Uh, I get a, basically, I get a call or I get a text um, that's just basically like, hey, can you play lock in tomorrow? It was still pandemic, too. Right. Can you play lock in? So it was a stripped down lock in. Um, but Where's that at again? It's in Virginia. Uh, right. I'm not really sure where. I just I basically got a text um, from Briley, um, who I didn't know, uh, Marcus's fiance, and basically got in the car. So I was I was actually landscaping because it was like uh, still pandemic, and I was making some money on the side, and I uh, <laughs> just. They were like, oh, you want to show up tomorrow at Lock-In? I was like, yeah, man. So I... How did they get your info? Uh, so uh, his name's William. He played in a band I, I played in before, and Briley knew William. And so he recommended me as a keyboardist to uh, fill in for Pete and because um, he you know, was off the road for a little bit. And uh, so I got the text, and I basically... Got in the car, no real information. They were like, I was like, am I just sitting in? They're like, nope, full set. And I drove to lock in the next day, played the set. And I was like, cool, man, that was great. And then they kept calling me back. And I was like, all right. And I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, you're like, I think the fourth keyboard player? Man, there's been a lot. Yeah, D vibes. Um, D vibes. And then. Uh, 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 there, I can't even remember the first one because you know I I hadn't really I don't think I'd ever met I met Marcus once um, in passing at a Tedeschi truck show but yeah there's a lot of them um, there was Dane Farnsworth uh, let's see a lot of fill-ins I think too but yep. yeah I I have no idea the list is like eleven. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Well, the great thing is you came in at the highest level. Yeah, right. I, <laughs> like the big gigs. Yeah, new I band. Was like, oh, you want to play Madison Square? I was like, yeah, man. I was <laughs> like, why not? Because you know, me and my fiance, we we bought a a place in the pandemic and the mountains. And you know, I was just a local guy. I had toured with other bands. Um, I had my own band called Metaphonia, and um, I was in the broadcast and let's see what else um Bifutis was a local band kind of like uh, we talked about uh, wrote about you know just kind of zappa kind of style stuff yeah so i was i was big i'm a big zappa fan and uh you know george duke 
So anyway, just they called, they pried me out, and um, I got on the bus and haven't left since. So here I am. How do you get your start on keys? Because you play um, an elaborate setup up there, all my favorites. You got the clavinet. Yep. You have the B3. You yep. got the whirly. Those are the greats. Other than the um, uh, the the one that Ray Manzarek also played, the uh, what's that one? Yeah, that's is, is, that, is it the Farfisa. Farfisa? Yeah, yeah, Farfisa. Right. So Farfisa is, um, you know, I've never actually, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to come across vintage keyboards because they're either a like, well, it's like guitar, you know, rare guitar is like eighteen thousand dollars, or you know, especially the modular synths. Um, but I. I was always kind of, I got a Moog at home and I was kind of, I even joined the, the digital age just because it was easy to load. Right. You know, Cause I had, I had done a few moves of the B3 and I was like, all right, for small venues, you know, it's, it's, you put your work in, but, um, yeah. So I, um, basically, um, I have at home, um, you know, like I do a lot of MIDI work too. So I do uh, music for video games. Uh, I did one on the Switch, um, Nintendo Switch. And, and you play the hell out of video games. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. That's one thing I do well. So when I was four years old, I started piano and it was classical piano. And um, I did Suzuki, this method from, uh, it's like a Japanese method. It's all by ear. So you had to listen to music every day, falling asleep kind of uh, thing. But uh, basically, at some point, I switched teachers uh, to a guy named Rick Setzer out of Hickory, where I'm from, in North Carolina, and started doing competing. So I, I would make money uh, competing for classical piano. Competing? Yeah. So Whoa, what's that like? It was cool, man. I, I just you go to like an event and you compete. Well, you do this regional. Um, uh, it's called federation, I think, or something like. That. You do a regional event, and you win that. If you win that, you go to state, and then you play state for money. And how do they judge you by how clean you play the piece? Yeah, it was like I was playing, you know, some Rachmaninoff or Liszt or Chopin or whatever uh, etudes, and you know, you had usually two pieces. And I would, you know, on my good day, uh, I won a few state competitions, which was like it is in high school, you know, like, oh, man, I'm making money doing this. So I was in a practice room. It was different from I wasn't on the road or doing uh, rock and roll until I was in my 20s. Wow. So I just I was like um, went to school at Appalachian State and did classical music basically had to teach myself jazz and rock so i went to the jazz instructor his name's todd wright in appalachian state there you go and uh i was like hey he, i was like i want to be in jazz band he's like all right come play for me and i was like all right and then i went and play, played for him and he's like nope oh. <laughs> and then you know i was like 22 yeah you know? and so then i had to you know just kind of get my ass kicked in jazz band you know or we're playing out i met this guy named andy page great guitarist out of uh, Boone, North Carolina. And we joined a band together called Bufutus. And um, still got a few records out there. I uh, made a few records. Still got one in the can. Uh, but um, it kind of cut my teeth there. Fusion. Like, I was a big Chick Corea fan. Um, you know, Keith Jarrett. Um, I mean, the list goes on. Oscar Peterson, you know, Monk, Art Tatum. Just studied the hell out of it. And... Uh, Bill Evans, yeah, as well. Did you think after the pandemic or during the pandemic, before the Marcus call, did you think that you were actually going to play music for a living or did you think it was kind of over because, like, are, are people going to be touring? Is there any more venues? That kind of stuff. What was your thought uh, in your mind? Well, you were probably the same way. You know, I'm not sure exactly how you were affected, but I remember just being, you know... Well, first of all, on the unemployment hotline, because I had my own businesses teaching and everything, and that all went away. So I was, it was pretty dismal for a while, man. I was, I did not, you know, really think it was coming back uh, that soon, you know. Um, I, I didn't believe it was never, you know, never going to reach, you know, I was basically never going to get out again. I didn't right. believe that, but... No, it was definitely, for me, I just took the time to practice and kind of figure out, like I said, I was landscaping, which, you know, I'd done that for a while in the past. I worked kitchen jobs, you know, I've, I've worked a lot of different things because I always wanted to learn about it. Um, 
I just took time to shed, man, and write. You know, I've always written a lot of music, so that was kind of what I did. Um, and I, I'm guessing you were doing some some comedy and writing stuff during that time. I don't, what were you doing when I was when COVID? Uh, I write on stage, so oh, if you? I'm not on stage, I, I mean, I write down premises in my phone. But if I'm not on stage. I'm not really working on comedy other than putting down ideas in the phone. Like I got a bunch of ideas from this tour yeah. and put them down in the phone and then yeah. I work them out on stage. Yeah. Um, kind of like a jam, you know? Um, I just started focusing on things that I could do, which was the podcast, which I've been doing 11 years. Yeah, but I awesome. thought, well... I'll start a podcast network. I'll start a different podcast. I'll have a few things going on and just try to keep my uh, mind positive yeah. and, uh, and moving. And, you know, like, you know, when we're in the arts, nothing's ever guaranteed. Right. And the great thing about I learned from COVID was when you're in a work world too nothing's guaranteed so you might as well be doing what you love to do yep because there's no game you know there's people that lost their jobs oh, yeah. 20 30 years they're just out yep. and uh, they maybe gave up some dreams to do that thinking it was secure yeah and one thing i realized during COVID is there's really kind of no security in life uh including your health and your job and your income or, or anything or your marriage if you had a marriage yep. or or anything just there's, there's nothing that's for sure so i did just move the energy the you know the you know because usually i just podcast and comedy like every day of my life right, right now i moved it all into podcasting and uh you know just Keep doing it, and the podcast got bigger and bigger. I had ACDC on, you no, know. That's sick, man. Yeah. Man, you're really, so. really, really killing it. And, you know, when you said uh, what the pandemic did to, you know, kind of your mentality, what I realized is the same things. Like, I, you know, I've, I've always been a family man. You know, I've always, living in the mountains of North Carolina, It it's beautiful. It's like, I don't really... I kind of got a little comfortable, I, uh, you could say, um, and you know everything's great. I have a beautiful fiance, Joni Ray, and she's an amazing artist. And I have a great family, um, Pam and Jim, who are coming to the Fillmore tomorrow at Charlotte, which I'm looking forward to. First show, yeah. I got them a little. They're like, ah, can we sit down? I'm like, all right, I'll find you some seats, you know. But um, you know, put it into pr perspective, because I've always been in the present, trying to live in the present. When I was even taking this gig, I remember just that was my mantra. I just, you know, like, I never thought I would be playing these gigs. Yeah, you know, right. Because I'd played, uh, I played in another band called The Broadcast uh, during that time. And it, it was kind of tough to leave, because they they are my friends and family, and I didn't want to burn that bridge but it was this opportunity it's like you're gonna play it's madison square garden you know and i was like man i got a call to come in from to boston and i was like i got on the plane and, and didn't leave you yeah. know so um oh yeah cool little thing uh i was in a another band called major magic been in a lot of bands you know and they all kind of had something happen to them i'll just say that and this band, we went to Nashville, did the showcase. They're like, oh, we got to get you with some writers and all that stuff. And I was like, all right, man, you know, that might be cool. And we're like, we're going to wait just a little bit and keep doing our thing. We were on tour, no big tours, but, you know, doing the, we're moving up, you know, writing. And, you know, we had a look. And uh, this guy from the Sticks, he was like, a, like a, some kind of producer or manager or something came into the studio we recorded a studio uh one song in the studio at appalachian state and he uh he was like man after we played he was like had skate shoes which i thought was a little weird but anyway skating around and stuff and uh he was like man I, i'm gonna fly you down tomorrow to join leonard skinner and we'll get you in with the boys or what was left of yeah. leonard skinner of that tour and who was left billy on powell it. position right uh, and and so i was like holy shit and he's like you know how to play the b3 and i was like man not well because like i said i was a pianist that had to learn b3 in bars you know yeah. i had a nord you know that i could but it's not the same thing right you know and i i learned b3 in in bars 
uh, like same as you were saying, just like on stage, you ride on stage. That's how we got to do it. You got to get your ass kicked and still always a growing thing anyway. But when I went with Marcus, I showed up to you know, for my first bus tour. It was the Leonard Skinner bus. And so I was like, you know, I'm 38. So I was like back in my 20s. I was maybe going to do that. And so it, the bus came back for me. I just, I don't know. I thought that was kind of cool. That's cool, man. Did it. Who are your rock B3 guys? You know, I love a lot of rock B3. I loved yep. Eddie Hirsch, who played in the Black Crows. I thought he was incredible. He really had a great, uh, you know, there's, there's some standard B3 where it's just kind of the, whoosh, you know, yeah, here just, comes the swells. You're, you're doing the motions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, well, Billy Preston, obviously, and Edgar Winter. I I actually just got more into him because he's nuts, and yeah. I really just like his attitude. Yeah, and it kind of reminds me of like, you know, John Lord, obviously, Christ. and you know, just what he had to marshal through the, you know, crazy, just just ideas like that. And you know, this first year that I've been in, um. I, I can't wait to try more things, you know, because I was just trying kind of like getting used to, like I said, the instrument. And like last night I was like, just, you know, moving the draw ball, uh, draw bars all around and you get more comfortable. It's a synthesizer basically. Yeah. The, the Hammond's like one of the, you know, so it's like, it wasn't my first instrument, but now after another year of being around it, I feel like I'm, I'm excited for the tonal possibilities, you know? And I just got one in my house, so uh, finally. Uh, I got a, it's basically like an A100 and a B2 body, and um, a 122 Leslie. So I've, my cats sit on it now, right? I'm, I can't wait to get back and play it. You know? <laughs> so anyway, it's, I, I hope to be one of those kind of crazy people. And, uh, you know, if the sleeves are off, and I got the bandana on, maybe it will happen. But that's a part of it. You got to have clothing <laughs> on that makes you feel like that, get yeah. into that, you know, because you got to be this weird thing, you know, yeah. uh, especially a keyboard wizard land. And, um, and, um, I love Yes, you know, it's like... I, That's great. You know, that was I'm a big prog fan. I'm a big jazz fan. Uh, Zappa, like I said, Zappa. Um, Tommy Mars from Zappa. I was a big fan of his weird-ass modes, his solos that he did. And all these guys kind of shape... Even classical guys, man. I, I play classically sometimes because Rachmaninoff or Prokofiev or uh, any of those Russian, uh, you know, just dismal, like, dark composers. That's what I love, man. I like I like the darkness yeah. know, of life. I mean, I also, you know... And, took me a while to play in major because i was like riding in minor you know what i'm saying right yeah the b3 is just a god instrument man. it is man it's just yeah it's yeah i've said it i've been doing the podcast 11 years when a band has b3 you know tom petty yeah uh black crows yeah these are the ones that were really were kind of doing it other than the classic rock people right. counting crows oh Wallflowers, First tape, right? Mommy Jaffe. Oh, I love the Wallflowers. Yeah, so, <laughs> you know, Wallflowers, that bring it down the horse record. Yeah. It's mostly B3. Yeah. T-Bone Burnett understanding how to get those tones and bring it along. Like, That's what you remember about those records yeah. a lot of the time yeah. is that organ tone because, you know, we were both big grunge fans, I'm sure. Big right? time, And, big you time. know, like Alice in Chains or St STP, but there wasn't as much in them. But in like Wallflowers, you always remember those little... Yeah, <laughs> Wallflowers, Counting yeah. Crows. There yeah. were bands. At the same time grunge was going on, you, still, you had that full-on uh, kind of horde tour people going on, you know? Yeah. And also, there's a lot of interesting uh, different keyboard players in the dead, you know? Yeah. Midland was like... Uh, oh, yeah. He, he was a good B3 player. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, everybody always asks me, who's my favorite? Is it Gotcha? You know, mm -hmm. or what? It's all, it's just all kind of different. Pigpen being a piano guy. Oh, yeah. Right. Know? Oh, yeah. So That's done that gone down that rabbit hole a few times, you know, yeah. uh, with it's funny with like a lot of those guys, you know, sometimes they're overlooked. I mean, they're not the great ones. You always re remember, obviously, that kind of did their tone work or they did something weird on it because right. that's, you know, uh, 
uh, from Yes uh, with the cape. Uh, drawn a blank. What's his? Uh, uh, oh, Rick Wakeman. Of course. Rick Wakeman. Yeah, Rick God. Wakeman. I mean, th- I love uh, when a keyboard player wears a, a cape. I mean, I like I magic. I like fantasy. Oh, I've yeah. always been into fantasy. I like weird. You I, know? Yeah, like anything that's going to stand out. And, 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 you know, just his style always influenced me. I was just like, dude, he's up there in a cape. I mean, I like yeah. wrestling. I like Ric Flair. I like I like people that are weird, you know? He played a lot of Mini Moog and Mellotron, too. Oh, yep. we saw a Mellotron at the Rock Hall yesterday. Dude, that was cool. Yeah, come A little come picture on. with that. Got a little, I was trying to get the right angle so it looked like I was touching it. <laughs> I think one of the greatest keyboard players of all time and completely underrated and over and over and over being underrated is John Paul Jones. Oh, yeah. And his oh. Mellotron work. Dude. And also later. Uh, lab work. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the stuff on No Quarter. No Quarter was it, what he's, uh, he's known for that, at least. Yeah. At least people actually can kind of pick that out. Because I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm one, I like to keep my life. I'm like, I like just kind of being an engine cog you know i like almost feeling like you're with the rhythm section because then you can look at them i mean i love comping guitar too i love playing behind and building the structures but it's a whole thing you know it's like good solo you know would you have a good night do you have a good solo like you know it's all of us back there we're all together doing it you know and that's that's what i love about uh that position um, but yeah, John Paul Jones is the man. And, and uh, on in through the outdoor, him embracing that Yamaha electric piano. Oh yeah, and the, taking uh, that whole record to another level. Was that what? Was that the CP uh, or was that uh, which one? Did I can't even remember. Let's what see what that one was because it was really uh, it was really monumental. Because I remember reading them like, yeah, I got to figure out how to play this. You know, and because it was kicking into the 80s. Right. That's 1980. And he like gets a- this keyboard in a box, you know, comes in a cardboard box. Yep. And he's just like, well, I guess I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll learn this thing. And it becomes the whole sound of in through the outdoor. That's, that's the most interesting thing. You can go for it with those kind of keyboards. Sometimes like, hey, it might, it, that's all you have to hope is that it could become a sound of a record or a sound of, a, you know, because totally. you don't know what this thing's going to do necessarily, especially back in the day. You don't get to YouTube demo it or, you know, see what you've got to buy this thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, hope, hopefully it, it's every every keyboard's got some cool tone on it. I feel like that you can find I believe like that the too. DX7. Even you know the DX7 was a classic one, but it was also there was later. that period in the '80s when I was playing music where it was like, you know, no keyboards, right. Yep. You know, I mean, we're not Bon Jovi here. <laughs> yeah. You know no, what I mean? Because they kink, 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 Right. And, and, you know, but in reality, it was such a cool sound yep. uh, that, you know, I, I realized later, like, oh, well, you know, we, we should add keyboards. And then later, of course, I got a, a B3 player in the band. And, yep. And, uh, and, and Wurlitzer and, and Clav and all that. And it just, you know, but there was that thing in the 80s where it was that 80s sounding keyboard yep. and it was on everything from new wave to rock yeah I've, you know I've, I'm, I'm not too good with models like junos and stuff like so, that yeah the roland juno was and that was even more kind of uh classic and i'm i'm actually terrible at, at, at knowing you know every keyboard that was i look them up when i have to learn the tones right. you know which is really important i think of any synth player is to learn certain tones you know oh uh, yeah to, to, oh, di- sure. to dial them in because synth is you know uh, you know b3 of course but any synth you're like if you can get that's what I spend time doing is going home and like, okay, what do I want to learn? Like the Stevie, you know, sound off of, uh, uh, golden lady or something like that. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, that, you know, that beautiful, you know, during that it's, that's what you do. You have to try to emulate it. Even if you got a shitty keyboard, maybe try, (laughs) Yeah. you know what I'm saying? (laughs) To get it on another one. That's not it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, man. Um, I mean, you got the Van Halen jump, you know. Was, was, do, 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 do. To me, you know, there's all these epic keyboards. And, of course, Kraftwerk being the kings of it. Yep. Gary Newman. Oh, yeah. All of that yep. incredible artistic 
crazy synth moog stuff you know yeah. and uh you know moog moog you know whatever. what's the what's the verdict on I that? Don't, you, know, you know some people say moog some say moog um it's like uh, when we were in Boise. Is it Boise or Boise? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Boise. I just found out. Boise. <laughs> uh, Barbara Streisand today, I was just reading this thing oh, about yeah? how she said, they've been saying my name wrong the entire career. <laughs> it's Streis Sand, S-A-N-D. What? Not <laughs> really? Sand, not Streisand. Streisand. Oh, yeah, yeah. Streisand. Yeah. Streisand. Yeah. Streisand. Streisand. That's, that's, uh, Isn't that crazy? That, that is, yeah. I, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's funny because I, you know, like I live in Boone, North Carolina. So, uh, where I, well, it's actually Ash County. I live in Ash County. Little, most people know Boone. But anyway, I yeah. it's near there. But Asheville, you know, where Moog was, with Bob Moog, that's what I usually, most people in that area call it Moog. It's like Appalachian. Yeah. Appal- when when someone Appalachian. says Appala- App- Appalachian, Appalachian, people lose it. Like, oh yeah. no, you yeah. Know? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's all nutty out there. It's nutty, man. i you know, that's one thing. I don't know if you ever get this, but sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, being on tour. We've been on tour for two months. You know, yeah, it's been a blast. I love this Insa- guy. Insane. Dean Del Rey is an amazing performer and everything. You know, I could really. Like, uh, I, I went to bed early because you, you I follow your lead. You know? Yeah. You know, sometimes they're like, Mike, they're yelling for me. And I'm like, nah, man, I'm, <laughs> how do I, how do I, have got another button on this curtain so I don't have to <laughs> you know, get out of bed? I got the rule, 1 a.m., I'm in bed. <laughs> you know, what? one of my favorite things you did, you, came, you come in, I was already in bed, and you came in, you're like, oh, oh, this is good. All right, man, that's the stuff. And then you get in your bunk, yep, and then I hear the curtain shut, I'm like, Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like you have a whole progression to I'm get just in the talking butt. to myself like, oh god, I can't wait to get it. Oh yeah, this is that's, so. That's it. It's just so glorious to get in your bunk after a long day of working, you know, long day into the night. Oh yeah, and man. noise and people, and you got to be on. You got to be out there, and like you know, we're at the VIP meet and greets, and and then we're performing, yep. and you, you're on the whole time, and then you yep. get on that bus. You drink a Topo Chico. That's oh, yeah. not an advertisement. <laughs> yeah. And then you just Maybe. go like, oh, yeah. All right. I'm good. Those Topo Chicos are smooth, man. I didn't realize, like, water could taste that good. It's so good, and, right? You know, and I, you know, I'm pretty just whatever's around. You know, we've been getting some good coffee on the tour. Oh, great. Uh, Had two good good ones today. No, did you? Next door here, man. Really? Oh, God, they were great. That. They closed at two, though. Those duffing golf balls all around all day. There's another one up the street. <laughs> I'm going to see if they're still open. I'm going to walk back up. I had one mud. The place was mud. Oh. Yeah, it was really good. That's that's uh, it's funny because remember that old do you remember that old coffee pot you probably didn't drink well, any coffee people, out yeah, the I best. remember when I worked construction people I gotta get a cup of mud <laughs> you know what I mean there's yeah, like yeah. a million words for yeah. coffee and a million for shit you know like <laughs> I was thinking about that a couple of days ago you know how people are yep. like oh, I got a pinch of loaf I gotta <laughs> drop the kids off at the pool oh yeah that was I gotta a classic drop one a deuce. There's, there's a million of them those and the words for Joe? cocaine like you got any oh, yeah. devil's dandruff going skiing <laughs> Going skiing, got any snow? Got a, got any toot? I need a bump. The toot was the I hadn't heard that one in a while. The the old toot. Your devil's dandruff. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Mark Ford called it chilly weather. Ah, that's good. <laughs> hey, you got any chilly Little place weather? Place called Aspen. <laughs> yeah, it's so there corny. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I, I remember we had that old coffee machine on the, yeah. the bus and it was like, it didn't turn off. So the coffee was like, it was in there for three days and it kept, you know, it was about to, the glass was about to shatter and, wow. you know, cause the, it just wasn't working. Uh, when didn't have any lights on it. So I remember the mud, when you said mud, I thought about one of those yeah. dark days of no coffee on the bus of this tour. I was like, I'm going to get myself some coffee. Oh, look, it's ready. And then it was just cooking, Ooh, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man. Uh, but yeah, man, you know, it's been a real, it's been Blast great. out here been with great, you, man. man. Like I'm I'll never to, forget it. I won't either, man. And you're going on with you're going on the you're going home for a couple weeks, right? Yeah. And then yeah. you're going on Burr. And then I'm well, I go do Vegas uh, residency, right. 14 shows, then uh, Philly, and then out with Burr. Close the year out with Burr. Nice. Yeah. No, that's gonna be fun, man. 
Uh, tell everybody where to find it. You got an Instagram. I got an Instagram. It's uh, sleeveless Mike Runyon, R U N Y O N. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I think, you know, followers are, I mean, I'm, I'm meeting fans every night. You know, I had to sign some boots, you know, usually the keyboard player, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm behind the, the box, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been really meeting some cool people. And, you know, that's a part of it, man. You got to just meet people and, and enjoy your life. I love it. That's, that's what I'm all about. I'm going to, Puerto Rico after this. That's my plan. And, oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, I'm going to Vieques and uh, going with Joni, my uh, fiance. And uh, yeah, man, just trying to trying to have a blast out here. And, you know, we all have, right? Oh, God. You know? <laughs> That's just, just crazy. Three uh, left. Yeah, three left. Uh, you know, tomorrow, you know, I'm from Hickory, North Carolina. So the Charlotte yeah. show got, got some peeps coming. Pretty much that place is going to be packed packed house tomorrow it's gonna be great man all right well thank you for doing the podcast and uh yeah, it's man. been a great two months with you man no nah, love you man thank it's you been buddy. great meeting you yeah. awesome